becomes a business relationship as it was with YouTube. And um, so it's kind of related to three different questions here, but I want people to understand my point, which is, um, in fact, I do believe that the old laws should apply and we should figure out ways to make everybody in the chain who is profiting responsible for their actions. And um, the cheapest and fastest solutions are going to be technical solutions. Okay, Konstantinos. Very, very briefly. Um, a couple of uh, two, two things. First of all, yes, this, uh, copyright exists in s the statute of Anne, and it's not accidental that it continues to exist right now. And technology also exists despite copyright and has evolved despite copyright. So a very big question that we need to figure out is how those two can mix in a harmonious way to provide answers that do not impede on technology, but at the same time provide the protection that copyright is meant to provide. And I think that's the tricky question. But saying that uh, it is technology or it is copyright and we just need to just forget either or, is n I don't think contributes anything real to the discussion as to how those two should mix. And right now, because of the internet, of course, there is this great need, the need for finding a way to just make them one thing is even more uh, important. And Desiree, I saw your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to add uh, something to what they uh, were saying and to make a clear point that there should be no automated solutions with copyright uh, takedowns when it comes to domain name system. It may work well with YouTube, but uh, when it comes to domain name system, we uh, should not ever um, retort to um, those kind of sanctions because of the proportionality argument, because of the uh, right to conduct a business. In Europe, for example, if you have a domain name register, that is your right to conduct business online. And uh, in addition, all the uh, court orders should have the freedom of expression checked um, and charges uh, respectfully uh, inspected before uh, reverting to ask for a domain name to be taken down. Um, some other people have also mentioned that um, a domain name as well may be actually um, having a third level and fourth level and serving much, much larger community than a single uh, video that may be um, actually found on that single website. So we need to be very careful and I need to say when it comes to domain name system there should be no automated web blocking or um, takedowns unless it comes it is a is a is a question of malware or spyware and intermediaries uh, they're very responsible and they um, do not have a business incentive to do that but they have a responsibility for serving and running the bits um, on the internet and uh, powering and keeping the fl flow of information um, in a secure and stable manner okay thank you everyone oh one more I, I just want to comment on Desiree's point so I'm I'm not as familiar with ACTA, and it had its own problems with transparency and process, and, and I understand that. I am more familiar with the, the SOPA proposal uh, in the United States, and I think that um, it's unfortunate that most people that were vehemently against it never read either the original language or the revised language of the bill. Um, it was a very narrow scope, and it was basically the, the Department of Justice using proper legal due process to identify before blocking the same way they do in the United States with illegal gambling websites and other things. Um, I don't think that anybody is thinking about doing anything automated in the DNS space. So that would not be a concern of mine anyway. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Oh, we have a question here. Don't forget to set, state the name for the transcript. Hi, I'm Sintra Suknanan. Um, I'm a first-time ambassador from ISOC, as well as an attorney in Trinidad and Tobago. My question um, to the panel, basically I've heard you discuss that there's an apparent fixation on the law, the need for enforcement, and the use of technology. Um, given the recognition of competing rights in most cases, some cases perhaps, um, what do you think um, about the use of alternate social mediatory techniques um, to act in parallel or even separate to law enforcement in order to facilitate parties finding their own solution to alleged infringements. And also, um, should the owners be placed on the intermediaries in uh, creating this solution, this new dynamic? 
Oh, that's a tricky question. Who'd like to field that one? Constantinos? Hi, I, I'm not sure I fully understood. Uh, if I understood correctly, you are referring whether we need to have alternative dispute resolution models running in parallel. Uh, I might actually wear for just a few seconds my academic hat on right now. Uh, be I did uh, quite an extensive research and I think that yes, when it comes to the internet ADR mechanisms, uh, at least at the outset, because of their efficiency, provide a lot of solutions. However, again, this is not the answer to everything. And just going through self-regulatory processes and ADR mechanisms will not solve all the problems that or the challenges that we are facing on the internet. There are very specific issues that need to be addressed concerning, again, due process, proportionality, um, the equality of the parties. So when it comes to speed and efficiency, yes, ADR mechanisms, mediation, arbitration, correspond better. And they have the huge advantage of taking an obstacle that uh, exists, which is jurisdiction. They alleviate any sort of jurisdictional problems. However, one of the things that I personally believe that needs to also be clear is that speed and efficiency are great, but due process and proportionality are even greater. So we really need to make sure that those are addressed before we proceed to any uh, form of ADR. Thanks. Okay, so I'm now just checking with our remote moderators. Do we have any questions? Not at this stage. Um, okay, so oh, we're getting we're getting some. This is excellent. We're getting some questions and comments from the audience. So, I think I saw this hand first. Don't forget to state your name. Okay, hello, I'm Jonas Mäkinen. I'm a composer and a pianist from Finland. Also, uh, I'm this potential lesson because. I totally agree about the law enforcement side, that it's a bad thing if we have laws that we can't enforce or are not enforcing. Uh, but I have to point out that some laws like copyright, I don't think they cannot be enforced reasonably without these endangerment like privacy and due process that we all talk about. People are simply using copy material that copyright applies to in uh, amounts that are magnitudes of order bigger than before the internet. So the potential lesson here, uh, is it not the case of governmental and lobbying weakness that we are creating laws that cannot be enforced in the first place and not that we're not for enforcing it? Thank you very much. Would anyone like to comment on, on that? Uh, Pedro? Well, I, I think that I agree. This happened a lot. Sometimes, you know, the some laws are written in a desk without even having exposure to the services or to the user experience or how internet works. There is a lot that, uh, that you know, it's completely uh, isolated from reality in the, in the, in the, in the legal, uh, in the legal drafting process in, in some countries. There are many countries that have very good technical bodies, but we can, we face that a lot in, in developing countries where, you know, sometimes some, somebody make a copy paste of different solutions and make a horrible cocktail of legislation and then this is this is something that is impossible to enforce and then it's lead to interpretation of the judges that are not really technically savvy and we end up with really radical uh, judicial decisions that affect you know the, the the internet ecosystem so yes you're right i think in many in in, in, in many, many cases that happen okay so if there's no oh yes trevor Yes, thanks. Um, we, we spend a lot of time in developing countries, A, trying to build awareness and understanding of this difficult copyright issue. We spend a lot of time with the police and the magistrates uh, and the policy makers to get them to understand this very difficult environment. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite a challenge. Um, but I would not agree that people take the time to, to, to implement laws that cannot be enforced. Um, I think many governments implement laws I, for different reasons, but then they don't have the will, the knowledge, the understanding, nor the mechanisms to enforce the laws. Um, and as I said earlier, any state that fails to enforce its laws is heading for trouble. And we can see a lot of that in the, the 
area of, of copyright. Copyright is becoming or has become a serious economic issue, not just for developed countries, but for developing countries. The, the culture in developing countries is rich, and out of that culture comes music and, and, and writings that are creating demands worldwide. And if developing countries do not come to terms with this copyright environment, then all the benefits, the rewards, the economic value that could flow back to the country as a result of exploiting those, those copyright related issues are going to be lost. So there's a lot of learning, a lot of awareness, and a lot of development. It's quite a challenge. Thank you, Trevor. David, I'm just going to ask you to hold that thought for a moment because there were a number of questions. Uh, so keep, keep what you're going to say for a little bit later. Uh, let me just take these questions or, or comments. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be a bit provocative, if that's okay. Um, it was a very sad story about the uh, the filmmaker who spent hundreds of thousands on a film and recouped $74. Um, but on the other hand, there are pay-as-you-go projects that have been very successful financially. And so I wonder if it wasn't perhaps that um, the film just didn't have the mainstream can, appeal can, to... Can you, can you give me a few Sorry, is it not? Can you give me a few examples? Um, well... Um, there's a, a project that I've, Sorry. You, you know the Kickstarter website, of course, that's one, one way of, um, of funding projects um, that can make hundreds of thousands of dollars very quickly. Um, the problem has always been for creators of things that are not mainstream, that um, they will be making these things partly for personal reasons or artistic reasons, and not because they want to appeal to a mass market. And so they have always been, unfortunately, starving artists and starving musicians, and there always will be. Um, so one can argue that the monopoly effect of copyright is actually to create a glut of just the most mainstream content. And so you could argue that if there is a reduction in the amount of content out there, which I have to say is difficult to see because there is still an enormous amount of content, both music content and film content, as the costs of production have gone down. But if we accept the argument that there has been some reduction, um, perhaps piracy is only just reducing a glut of content that copyright is responsible for producing due to the effects of that monopoly. What do you have to say about that? Okay, I, I'll go back to YouTube because it's a wonderful example. Um, uh, many of those, um, let's say, amateur musicians, amateur content creators, if they were uh, producing music or music, they have, there, there are ways for them to make it available widely. Um, but the statistics show that 19 of the top 20 most viewed videos on YouTube were professionally created music videos made by the companies that I represent and the companies I used to work for. And number six, by the way, is Charlie Bit My Finger, and all of the other ones um, are from major, uh, you know, professional content creators. Um, as much as we'd love to say that there's a glut, that the demand is for high quality professionally created content there's not a big demand on the internet for amateur created content most of which is crap let's face it but some of which is not and so i think we we now have a way to make that available you know there are 21 million songs available on itunes but 80 percent of them have never been sold even once in the uk because they're garage bands and indie artists from around the world that nobody cares about. So, um, I got the red card. That's right. Okay, we're running short. Pedro, if you can do it in 30 seconds so we can move to other questions. Well, in terms of good examples, I recommend you to find the, the work of Julia Nunes, who plays the, u yeah, the ukulele and basically monetizes all his work through YouTube and Kickstart. And then uh, we can have Khan Academy in terms of you know, a way to use educational services. Another, another thing you mentioned that top top videos in YouTube are from from yes. from, from from you know institutional artists. And but given the the amount of information that is in YouTube, that doesn't mean that there's not a need. 
because we have billions of content that might be not from, you know, the, the institutionalist creators. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about 60 sec, every 60, uh, every, every, every minute, 60 hours of videos uploaded to YouTube. You might say that a lot of will be crap, but there is a lot that is not, and there is a lot that many consumers are willing to consume. And I think that, you know, it's, 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 the, all generalizations on this are bad, you know, because you might get the Okay, the, the moderator is going to intervene. One yeah. sentence. One sentence. I think it bears noting that although most amateur content is crap, most professional content is also crap. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it's the crap that people want. Uh, okay, we've got another question from the audience. Okay, um, I'm uh, Chris. I'm one of the uh, IGF ambassadors this year with ISOC. Um, I'm from Mauritius, actually, but um, I would like to bring a twist to what we've been talking about. Uh, you talk about copyright, intellectual property. Uh, one thing that I've not really heard from the panel, or probably the question was not there, uh, something that's actually slowly creeping up is actually cloud computing. And most of the content would actually go, obviously, somewhere. And intellectual property would definitely be something that we need to look at somewhere in between, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I'd like to hear what the panel thinks about it because there needs to be framework, there needs to be the law. Obviously, they all come together again because now it's the companies who are actually putting their data on the other side of the wall. And it has been discussion, but I haven't really seen much happening on that side. And people always, everybody wants to be on the cloud. So I'd like to hear what you have, Sissi. Okay, before anyone answers that question, just a reminder, we've got five minutes left. Is there anyone else in the audience who has something that they want to say? Okay, you can say it quickly. Last chance. Okay, very quickly. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Svetlana Malceva. I'm from Moscow. Uh, it's evident uh, that a good solution of a discussed problem is uh, the balance uh, between uh, technology, law, and uh, non-law regulation. Uh, so my question is, uh, who must be responsible for this uh, solution? Lawyers of uh, technologists. Okay, now, everyone, we have five minutes left, so we're going to combine answers to this question with your takeaway messages. So uh, if I give you 30 seconds each to answer as you choose, starting with Konstantinos working down the table. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Christine. To answer your question, I think this is what we call a multi-stakeholder model. There is not an easy answer. Uh, lawyers can provide the legal background, technologists can provide the technological background, civil society can provide the civil society input, and governments are coming in also to provide their own input. So uh, I really think that this is a space that true collaboration can exist between all the interested parties, and it needs, it needs to exist. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you. Susan. Um, I think that the cloud computing discussion is an important one, but I, it's, I, it's already subsumed within everything that we've been discussing because YouTube is part of the cloud. And so I'd like to um, also say that uh, I think I just want to reiterate my earlier point about the importance of looking, understanding a different conceptual framework for rewarding. Uh, creators instead of mapping the uh, copyright concept onto um, onto uh, the internet because it does it does bring up a lot of um, problems for intermediaries so just keep the internet open that's my point. Pedro just to point out the need of focus on resiliency I think that uh, all the stakeholders need to be more resilient to change to adapt better to user needs uh, we we are facing a, a, a big change in the in the way that users behave, what users demand, and the, I think that the industries that are going to the, the the most resilient industries or actors are going to be the ones that are more are going to be more likely to success. You know, if uh, and and, the, and this is the question: evolution. And I always remem reminds me, you know, what happened with dinosaurs. You know, the T. Rex was the best hunter, but he also disappeared at some point. If because if if you don't can adapt, you might get extinct, and I think that this is part of the of the discussion here: how we adapt ourselves to. Sorry, he pointed the red card. <laughs> um, David. Um, yeah, I, I agree on the point about multi-stakeholders, and um, 
my take would be a little bit different. I think that the multi-stakeholder process is necessary, especially for transparency, and we've we've seen that and 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 clearly um, act as the probably the best example of of people um, resenting the fact that there wasn't transparency. Having said that, I'm not sure that every possible stakeholder that we can list is well enough educated on the issues or has has the same interest in the issues. So while uh, I'm a big fan of multi-stakeholders, I think there may be a kind of front row and back row. And the back row is there to see what's happening and get the transparency, but leaving it to certain people like the gentleman next to me, um, who are experts in the area of copyright and other things, to facilitate the negotiations and discussions. Thank you, Trevor. I'm not sure about the expert bit, but I am indeed the gentleman to your right. <laughs> um, um, my, my takeaway is that, uh, I repeat, that international, um, uh, the internet, sorry, requires public policies to benefit from international collaboration. These things that are happening in separate countries will not necessarily make things worse, but they clearly would not make it better because the internet does not respect the borders. I also would like to emphasize that the balance of the economic, social, and cultural uh, objectives should be seriously taken into consideration in the development of any public policy initiative. Thank you. Desiree. A little to be add to that, and um, I think one thing is certainly accepting that entrepreneurs are there talking to technologies and lawyers and moving things forward and doing it, um, it within the regulations that exist and the model is working. Um, so what we need to do is really accept this um, disruptive force that is changing the shape of 21st century and it has all the social and economic benefits that it brings with it. But we do need to pay um, special attention to the users that are um, using the technology and listen to them more carefully in order to make successful, uh, successful business models um, that would satisfy um, the needs of uh, both sides. Uh, thank you. Now, so I'd like to say thank you to all of our remote participants, our in-room participants, and ask you all please to uh, thank our excellent panel in a normal way. Good job, everyone. Thank you. And I would like to thank Christine for doing an excellent job in moderating this panel. Thank, thank you, you, Christine. Boxes might see them, but Rodney has it.